Good morning. My name is Pat Wolf. Um, I'm a former teacher. I've taught every grade level from kindergarten through um, university. However, about 20 years ago, when the decade of the brain uh, ended, it occurred to me that we're teaching kids brains and we don't know how they work. And I became very, very interested in what would current neuroscience or brain research have to tell us about how kids learn. So this morning, we're going to take a quick look at what I think are some of the um, reasons or the rationale is for teachers to become more knowledgeable about how the human brain works, what we know and what we don't know, and what the implications and applications are for the classroom. Let's begin with looking at traditional education, um, certainly the way I was raised. The emphasis in traditional education has been on the acquisition and manipulation of content. Students were asked to memorize facts and figures, names, dates, places, and events. I'm sure all of you who are of an age remember having to learn all of the state capitals, although I'm never sure what good that did me. Um, the dates of the Civil War, who the major uh, players were in North and South uh, events. And if you could give that information back on a test, you made a very good grade and you were supposed to, you were supposed to be educated. And subjects were studied in total, in total isolation. Um, for example, even in the elementary school, there's a certain amount of time that is allotted to language arts, a certain amount of time for math, for science, for health, etc. And then when you get to middle school or high school, it's even worse because you go to a different teacher for each subject. Very seldom did those teachers know what another teacher had taught. So there was no, um, there, was, there was no collaboration between them. People didn't see how um, what they were studying in math had to do with what they were studying in science, what they were studying in history had to do with any other subject. So basically, in, in my opinion, we were operating under a false assumption. And that assumption was that if students concentrated, paid attention, and mastered the content, they'd be able to retain substantive information about the subject, and they'd be able to apply it in the real world outside of school. Because you know, our job is not to help kids do well in school. Our job is to help kids do well in life. Howard Gardner, who most of us know as the person who um, devised and taught us about different intelligences stated that the majority of our students could not apply what they learned when faced with new unanticipated situations. If they hadn't learned about it in school specifically, and they came up with a new situation, and actually that's all they're going to come up with. Because if you think about it, we are teaching students to live on a planet we've never seen. Look at the advances in technology, especially when I was in school, because at my age, we didn't even have television until I was 14. So I remember asking what the World Wide Web was. I remember asking what a computer was. Well, take that information and jump ahead from today, 10 years or so. The situations that our students are going to face are ones that we've never faced and we can't teach them about it. What we can do, we can teach them to think, we can teach them to problem solve and teach them what to do when they come up with a new or unanticipated situation. So why should you become informed about brain research? Is this another fad? And believe me, I've lived through a lot of them. No, it's not a fad. It is foundational information about how people learn. Because we've been working with brains we've not understood. I remember teaching first grade and teaching beginning reading. And I would say about 70% of my students learned to read regardless of what I did. 
and the other 30% didn't, and I had no idea what to do, except to try more of what I'd done before. Our theoretical base has been the behavioral sciences, you know, um, positive reinforcement. If you positively reinforce kids, they'll do it again. However, if they don't understand what they're doing, the positive reinforcement doesn't work and neither does negative reinforcement or punishment. So the theoretical base for educators um, was a false one to begin with. We have operated intuitively. And by intuitively, I mean, we do something, if it worked, we continue and do it again. If it didn't work, we stopped it. But we couldn't explain to anyone else why we were doing what we were doing and the rationale behind it. Um, we've done a, a doggone good job intuitively, but we have been like physicians who didn't have a basic anatomy course. We're teaching brains and we didn't have any idea how they worked. What we need to become is a scientific profession that understands not only the structure of the human brain, but how it functions. The reason we can do this is that up until recently, the only way you could study a brain was through autopsy. And autopsy, of course, is a dead brain, and you can't tell hardly anything by looking at it, except maybe a person died of a stroke. <clears throat> what we have now is um, a whole slew of brain imaging techniques. This is just one of them. This is called a PET scan. And you'll notice that there's a white outline drawn around the brain because a PET scan only shows functioning of the brain. It doesn't show the structure. And in this scan, the brain operates on glucose. And so they inject radioactive glucose into a person's bloodstream. And then they, engage, they put them in a scanner and they engage them in some activities. And for example, in the first one that you see um, passively viewing words, the person's in the scanner, have the radioactive glucose in their brain, and they're asked to just view words. When they do that, the part of the brain that is responsible for seeing these words lights up. And we now know that the back part of the brain is the part of the brain that allows us to see, to take in visual information and translate it. If we change the activity and ask people to listen to words, what we're looking for is what part of the brain takes in auditory stimuli and allows us to hear it and to recognize it. That activity is on the side of the brain kind of over the ear. If moving down, <clears throat> we ask people to generate verbs, for example, I would say uh, broom, and I would ask you to give me a verb that matched broom, and you'd probably say sweet. Well, that takes place in the frontal lobes of the brain, right behind your forehead, because this is part of the brain where you have stored your memory of what brooms do. And then if we ask you to speak words, we see an area on the side going up to the top of the brain. And this is the language area of the brain. This is in the left hemisphere. And this is the part of the brain that allows you to um, decide what you want to say and to actually speak it. So with these imaging techniques, we can actually look at what's going on in the brain when a student is learning. For example, going back to my example of not knowing what to do with the student who didn't learn to read, Dr. Sally Shaywitz at Yale has put kids who are readers and non-readers in a scanner to see what's going on in their brain when they can read or cannot read and has actually discovered an area of the brain in the non-readers, dyslexic readers, if you will, that is inactive and has come up with a program to literally activate that part of the brain. Wish I had known this when I was having trouble teaching kids to read. So with brain imaging techniques, we are now learning a lot, not everything, but a lot about what's going on in the autistic brain, the ADHD brain, the dyslexic brain, or in a normal 
um, student in your classroom when they are learning certain subjects. At a base level, your brain is composed of over 100 billion brain cells, and these are called neurons, and they communicate at synapses. These brain cells talk to each other. You have about 100 billion of them, and they form huge maps or webs that contain what you know, your information. So what is learning and what is memory? Learning is the act of making, strengthening, and pruning away connections between thousands of neurons that form these neural networks. In other words, when you learn something, if, if a, I give you a new word, which is radioactive glucose, your brain makes a connection between brain cells and that information is stored. Now, if you use that, and say you teach it to your students that this is how they're learning this, their brain cells are making connections, and you spend a lot of time with that, that connection becomes stronger and stronger and stronger. But if after this webinar, <clears throat> you never use that term again, guess what will happen? The brain will prune that connection away, it'll become weaker and weaker, and so you will not remember it. Because memory is the ability to reactivate previously made connections. So how many of you took a foreign language in high school? Probably everyone. How many of you speak it fluently today? Probably very few of you. Uh, I took Greek and Latin and remember almost nothing of what I learned. And the reason for that is, it's a use it or lose it brain. If you continue to activate the connections you made, if you use them on a day-to-day -day basis or week-to-week -week basis, those connections will stay strong. If you do not use them past the test, they're gone. And this is often why you can give kids a spelling test and they can make an A, get them all correct, and a couple of weeks later misspell the words because they were not used. What the scientists are fond of saying is that neurons that fire together, wire together. Actually, they don't wire together. It's a chemical reaction. But what they're saying is, if you want strong memory, if you want your kids to retain what they have learned in school and to be able to use it outside of school, then we're going to have to do some pretty effective rehearsal and to use that information. Here's an example. <clears throat> the slide on the left is from the outer layer of the brain of a newborn. And what you see there are brain cells. And you see the little, they're called dendrites that connect with other ones. On the right side is a two-year-old. Look at the connections that have been made. Not new brain cells, but new connections because the child in the first two years learns more than it will ever learn again. Now, the problem with this here, with this particular slide, the newborn and the two-year-old, is the two-year-old has too many connections. Some of them are not correct connections. They have false beliefs about how things work. So the brain, in its ultimate wisdom, decides to start pruning away the connections that were not used. And this is what, exactly what happens in your students' brains. They can do very well, give you the right answers, and then not be able to use it because they have not used it or have not seen the applications for that information. So what have we learned from current brain research or from neuroscience? I'd like to go through four major findings that have application, I think, to the classroom. And the first one is that experience literally sculpts the brain. This is called neuroplasticity. Neuro means mind, plasticity means malleable or you can change it. Um, it's absolutely amazing. When, for example, when children are born, they can hear the sounds of every language in the world, probably over 6,000 of them. However, very early, the connections representing the sounds that have been reinforced. In other words, if you're born in an English-speaking country, 
you hear English sounds all the time, over and over and over. Guess what happens? Those connections become very strong because they're used and because you hear them. So the child is learning to speak a language long before he or she can speak because those connections are being made stronger and stronger because they're hearing English. However, the sounds that were there when they were born that would have allowed them to speak Japanese or German or Hindi, any other language, when those are not reinforced, they're going to wither away. And by about adolescence, those are gone. Now, can you learn a language uh, after adolescence? Of course you can. However, it's highly unlikely you can speak it without an accent, and it will be very, very difficult. So this is an example of plasticity. The brain is ready to learn, but the connections that are made and made stronger and stronger and stronger will remain. Those that they do not hear will eventually fade away. What do you think would happen, for example, in the brain of a person who is born blind? There are about 300 million brain cells back in the visual part of the brain, which will allow you to see color and depth, etc. Um, those are not activated in a person born blind. So what do you think happens to those 300 million brain cells? Would they fade away? They do not, believe it or not. They change their function and become auditory cells and tactile cells. This is why people who are born blind have more acute hearing and tactile sensation. The brain is so plastic in those early years that it makes that adaptation and uses visual cells to become auditory cells or tactile cells. Plasticity, this ability to change the brain, is a feature throughout, the throughout your life. In fact, you can learn new skills today because you still have plasticity. However, young brains are much more malleable, much more plastic than adult brains. This is why the best time to learn a second language is actually very early. Children born in bilingual homes who hear and learn to speak both languages, speak them both with perfect accent and believe it or not, are not confused by hearing the two languages. What I'm telling you is that experience literally changes the brain. You aren't just teaching kids. You are sculpting their brains by what happens in the classroom. So this is the first and probably one of the most important findings that has come out of neuroscience in the last 10 years is this amazing plasticity or malleability or ability to learn in the human brain. The second finding is that your brain is a pattern seeking device. Our species has not evolved by taking in meaningless information. If you're out on the savanna, okay, and uh, you've got a saber tooth tiger coming towards you, what's the meaningless information in this scenario? The meaningless information is that saber-toothed tigers eat people. Now, if you focus on something that is not relevant, the speed of that tiger coming towards you, or whether or not you've seen that other tiger before, you don't get your genes passed on. Are we giving kids meaningless information that they will never use? Because every encounter with new information requires the brain to find an existing network of brain cells in which this particular information fits. In other words, when, when you start teaching something to kids, kids are going to try and find something that's already in their brain that they can use to understand it. So for example, if you're teaching ratio, um, you might want to talk about making or putting together frozen lemonade and how many cans of water you need to learn how to concentrate. That information, that information that's already in the brain will greatly reduce your understanding term ratio because the term ratio is not as generally in the brain of the usual fifth grader going to ratio. So what I'm telling you that if the brain can't find a network, can't find a place, if it doesn't make sense to them, they will memorize it 
for the test, but it won't be stored long term after the test. When I taught middle school, my students would line up outside the door and they wouldn't come in until the bell rang. And then when the bell rang, they came rushing into the room and said, give us the test, quick, don't talk. Now, why they said that was they had memorized meaningless information to some degree, and they wanted to get it down on paper before they forgot it. I found that all too true throughout my teaching career. The kids who could memorize well, who knew what you wanted on the test, got really good grades, but that doesn't mean they really understood it. And it certainly doesn't mean that they retained it. And it absolutely doesn't mean that they'll be able to use it in the real world. So how do you make information meaningful to kids? If you want to make information meaningful, you have two choices. First of all, find the experience they've already had and hook the new information to it. You can use baseball scores. You can use, if you're teaching parallel lines, you can use a door frame. Anything you can do to hook new information or new terms to something, find something they already know. Now, good teachers do this all the time without realizing the neuroscience background behind it. What if you can't find something that they already know? Create the experience with them. I watched a high school teacher not long ago, and she is teaching them about McCarthyism and the hunt for communist. And she had them play a game where they divided up into dots and non-dots. Of course, they didn't know that the non-dots were communist, and they tried to infiltrate groups, and for different reasons, people would keep them out. And at the end of this uh, simulation that they did, the kids really understood what it meant to be accused of being a communist when you weren't, of not being allowed, of lying, or of turning someone else in. So things like simulations and role play, especially in history and in science, where much of the information doesn't make sense, can really help the students understand and make the information meaningful and increase the probability that it's retained, number one, and that it can be applied in the real world. The third one, it has to do with emotion. And what we've learned is that emotions are a primary catalyst in the learning process. They really impact whether you learn or not. So for example, Emotion can play either a negative or a positive role in the learning process. If a student perceives a situation to be threatening, the thinking part of the brain shuts down and learning is impeded. Uh, this can be as simple as calling on a student. And for example, one of the strategies that I highly recommend is instead of calling on one student when you ask a question, have them turn to a partner and discuss the question and walk around and listen to what they're saying. This removes the threat of if I raise my hand and I'm wrong, the other kids may laugh, they may make fun of me, I may feel embarrassed and I won't raise my hand again. So we need to make sure that the room is not only physically safe, but it's psychologically safe. Because when you're in a threatening situation, you do not think well. The frontal lobe is the part of the brain that does all your higher level thinking, literally shuts down. On the other hand, if the emotion generated by a learning experience is pleasant, chemically, learning is enhanced. And this is why when you go back and remember your own experiences from your childhood, two kinds of memories will stand out those which were very negative and those which were very positive because in both cases, chemicals are released to increase the probability that that will be retained to increase its memory. And of course, you want to use the positive ones in your classroom and simulations are positive, games are positive, being able to discuss it with a partner instead of in front of the whole class is positive. The fourth and last finding <clears throat> 
is that we used to think memory was just memories with just one kind of memory. What we know now that there are two very distinct and different types of memory. And the first one is called procedural memory. These are skills and habits that have been practiced to the point where they are automatic and unconscious. For example, have you ever driven a car somewhere over a very familiar route? You get to your destination and you cannot recall having driven there. Now you've driven a very heavy piece of of machinery at a fairly fast speed. How, how on earth can you do that without thinking about it? Well, what happens is when you get in that car and you turn on the ignition, you've done this so many times, you kick in or activate a whole network of neurons that have done this before and they take over. This is the same thing, skill of reading. For example, you don't sound out every word as you read. By this time, you, you already know when you're halfway through a sentence what the rest of the sentence will be. Your reading skills are at the point where you can concentrate on the content. Uh, things like walking, you don't have to stop and think, which muscles do I move to move my legs to walk? That's called a procedural memory. It, it was sports, with swimming, with music, any generally motor skill that you've done over and over, it's now automatic. You don't need to think about it. We've often called this muscle memory, probably not terribly accurate. It's better called procedural. So those procedures, those habits and skills that are automatic. But there's another type of memory and it uses another part of the brain and it is called declarative memory. And this is your general knowledge and your life experiences that you can declare. Your name, your address, where you live, where you go to school, what two times two is, what the Civil War, when, when that took place. Now, the reason you need to know that there's two types of memory is that you need two types of rehearsal. For procedural memory, what are you gonna to need to do? You're going to need to practice and practice and practice. And incidentally, practice does not make perfect, it makes permanent. If you practice wrong, incorrectly, that becomes automatic as well much repetition is needed. So you don't learn to drive a car by reading about it in a book. You have to drive a car and drive a car until it becomes totally automatic and unconscious. So for skills like that, for baseball, for swimming, for learning to play the piano, you need rote rehearsal, just a lot of practice in exactly the same way, the correct way. But for declarative memory, Repeating it over and over does not make strong connections. This is where we need what I call brain compatible strategies. You can see a list of them there. Reciprocal or peer teaching, using metaphor and analogy, using something the kids already know to help them understand something new. Problem-based learning, where you give the kids a problem they have to solve to use their information. Using visuals and graphics. Simulations like the one I mentioned when the dot game, hands-on activity, and incidentally, anything you've learned in rhythm, rhyme, or rap, that's, these are called elaborative rehearsal strategies where you're taking the information, making it meaningful, making it uh, emotional, making it fun to increase the probability that it is retained. So to kind of, pull this together, let me tell you what I think effective rehearsal, especially elaborative. The more you elaborate on information at the moment of learning, the stronger the memory. So you may teach it through just telling it to them. You may show them a video. You may have them play a game. The more ways in which you can elaborate on the information, the stronger the memory. The more modalities you use, you know, we have a tendency in the classroom to do a lot of talking. However, if, if they use visual, if they have a, a picture is worth a thousand words, the brain loves pictures and it retains pictures longer than it does words, I'll tell you. So, and, and movement, movement is, is extremely important. So the more modalities, then the more paths you have to retrieve it. You can retrieve it visually or auditorily or kinesthetically. And this one is extremely important. 
The more real world examples given, the more likely the concept will be understood, remembered, and applied. So if you're teaching kids to multiply fractions, give them a situation in the real world after school in which they'll have to use it. Otherwise, they may never use it. And I think this is one of our biggest faults. We very seldom let kids know how the information we're teaching them is going to be used in the real world. And the more you can link it to something they already know, the stronger the memory will be. So I guess the bottom line here is that I'm a strong believer that the more we understand about the human brain, the better we'll be able to design instruction that matches how it learns best. It's not all the answers. You're still going to have kids who have difficulty you know, learning. But I can guarantee you that a brain compatible classroom based on an understanding of the human brain, its structure and its function and how it works. Okay, and I will tell you that for many of you, you're already using brain compatible strategies. You just didn't know it. And I think it's important to teach kids how their brains work and why you're using particular strategies because you want them to become lifelong learners and you want them to carry these strategies with them. Now, at this point, what we're going to do is open this up for questions. And I do hope you will ask any question you have. This has been a very brief overview of the brain and how it learns. And I'd be happy to try and answer any of the questions you may have. recommended readings. Yes, I do have a recommended. Um, this, I hope this doesn't sound like it's self-serving. When I started learning about the brain, which was around 25 years ago, I couldn't find anything to read. Most of the books out there were written by neuroscientists, for neuroscientists. Um, eventually what I did was I wrote my own. So I have a book called Brain Matters, Translating Research to Classroom Practice, which you can find online at, at Amazon or any of the bookstores. Um, oh, there are so many books. Tell you what, I have a website. It's www.patwolf, and that's all one word, and wolf has an e, dot com, patwolf.com. And I have a list of probably 50 books, and you might want to take a look at that list on my website and see which of the books would uh, fit what you want to know. You want to know more about the brain. Uh, in my book, I include, the first part of the book is on the structure and function of the brain. The next part of the book looks at brain development from birth to adolescence. And the next part looks at memory systems. And then the last, probably fourth of the book, uh, are brain compatible strategies. So I would recommend going on the website and taking a look. That's www.patwolf.com. Sebastian says there are three questions. Okay. Let me see one, so let me just. Well, here we go, I'm OTR, what would you recommend? Okay, so the question is, I'm an OTR. Um, Occupational therapist, help me with what OTR is. That is, okay. Um, what would I see? What is recommended? Neuroanatomy and related classes from, okay. Um, occupational therapy has an awful lot to do, been through it myself, as a matter of fact, with um, the motor part of the brain and how it works. Um, Every part of your body is represented on a, um, a band of, of neurons, brain cells, that goes from ear to ear. And so, for example, if I wiggle the fingers on my right hand, I know that brain cells right here are firing. 
And because of neuroplasticity as, as an occupational therapist, the marvelous news is, is that because of plasticity, you can change the problems in this motor strip called the motor cortex through practice. For example, um, a lot of research recently on strokes, and they used to say that, you know, if you um, work with a person for six months, uh, you may be able to help them regain use of an arm or a hand or a leg or whatever, or speech. Uh, after that, not much use. Well, that has been, um, that's been disproven. People who've had strokes and no therapy for six years, uh, with repeating, for example, there's a person who could not use um, his right arm at all. So they strapped the left arm to his chest so he couldn't use it. And the therapist moved the arm over and over and over and eventually activated those particular cells to the place where that person gained some movement. This is not an area of, of expertise for me, but I do know that is, if I were an occupational therapist, I'd be very excited about the research on plasticity. And I would pick up the book, I think it's called Change Your Brain, Change Your Mind, which I um, hope that's the right book. Uh, but do here again, look at the website because the book is there on what they're doing as far as working with stroke victims. What are some of the biggest myths about the brain? Oh, myths about the brain. I love this. There's something called neural myths. That's what I call them. Um, you know, when people don't understand something, they often make up a reasonable explanation for it, which is not true. Some of the most common myths about the brain, number one, you only use 10% of the brain. You've heard that over and over. They use it in advertising. It's not true. Use all your brain all the time. I have no idea where that came from. Uh, another myth about the brain is that we are right-brained or left-brained. We're not. You do have a right hemisphere and you have a left hemisphere. They're joined together by a big band of fibers called the corpus callosum. Um, they have different functions. They have different functions. For example, almost all of your ability to speak a language is in the left hemisphere. But you have another area in the right hemisphere, which allows you to put emotion uh, into your, your words. So if you had a stroke in the language area in your right hemisphere, you could still speak, but you would speak in a monotone with no inflection in your voice. Why people think you are right-brained or left-brained is that the left hemisphere of the brain happens to take care of more of the details of the brain, um, your ability to calculate, your ability to write complete sentences, where the right part of the brain sees the big picture, so to speak. So if you have a person who's detail-oriented, people would have a tendency to call that person left brain, all right? And if you're a person who is more interested in, in the whole big picture, they call them right brain. Actually, those traits are genetic traits. They're inborn, and they don't have anything to do with a preference for right or left brain. So there's no such thing as a right brain person or a left brain person. Another myth is if you drink a lot of water, you do better on test scores. I don't know where that came from. And I have no idea how you would set up that experiment to prove it. That is not true. I'll tell you what happens. They go to the bathroom a lot more. Um, there's a lot of myths. There's a myth that every drink of alcohol kills 50,000 brain cells. I have no idea how they would figure that out. That's not testable. Um, alcohol actually does damage the brain terribly prenatally, and the adolescent brain is more vulnerable to alcohol, but there is no proof that it literally kills brain cells except in the fetus. Those are some of the most common myths about the brain. There's a lot of them. Pat, is neuroscience generally taught in teacher pre-service programs? Is neuroscience taught in pre-service programs? Um, recently, we're seeing more and more of it being taught in my pre-service. Nobody ever mentioned the brain, but of course I'm old, so that was a long time ago. 
um, unencouraged. Harvard now has a um, master's and a doctoral program in uh, called Mind, Brain, and Learning. Uh, several big universities have now started including neuroscience in, um, in pre-service education. Um, I wish it were a lot more. I'm hoping that this is a trend that we will see accelerate. The most recent neuroscience information educators are receiving is about how trauma changes the brain. What do you think about this? Trauma certainly does change the brain, but I'm not sure that this is the most important information that teachers need to have. I mean, how many students do you have in your classroom who have had, you know, major injuries to the brain, perhaps concussions, et cetera? That is important information to be sure, but I think the, the more important information is, is the, the basic information <clears throat> about how brain cells connect when you learn and what makes strong connections and how do you teach so kids, you know, can use what they've learned in school in the world outside of school, which is, is our purpose. Um, trauma, yes, but I wouldn't spend a lot of time on it. It should be part, I think, of a total program of uh, how the brain works and how kids learn. How can we get more administrators on board with regard to brain learning and do you conduct more detailed workshops for staff developers? Okay, how do we get administrators? You know, uh, I've been doing this for 25 years and I love to get um, an audience with administrators in it. In fact, what I really love is uh, an audience of administrators and teams of teachers, so they're learning this together. Um, I think what you can do is you can present information to administrators and do I conduct workshops? Um, not as many as I used to. However, I do, what I'm trying to do now is to kind of work myself out of a job. So I'm training trainers. Uh, to do what I've been doing for the past 25 years, to do workshops. I have workshops for, for an hour, for three hours, for a day. In fact, in February in Orlando, Florida, I'm doing a four-day training of trainers. And at the end of that, I give you all of my uh, PowerPoint presentations and give you a good enough foundation that you can go out and train other people. I think probably one of the best things you can do is to use the practice in your own classroom and then have the administrator come in and explain why the kids are doing so much better than they did before because you're using green compatible strategies. At least that's one way. Are any of the slides from today's presentation going to be available after? I would be happy to share these. Um, with anyone i'll have to talk to the, the people who are running the program but i'd be happy to have you you have these slides and if that is not true you can this is dangerous but i'll try it you can go to my website and get my email address and you can email me and i'll send them to you what are one or two points you feel all children should understand about their brains and how they learn what should all children know about their brains and how they learn I think they should, you know, I wish that the brain research and neuroscience were part of the curriculum, obviously, because that's my field. Um, I would start teaching kids, even in kindergarten, about how their brain has all these wonderful brain cells. And I would teach them the parts of a cell and how cells connect. And I would teach them um, some of the strategies and some of the things they need to do to make strong connections. I watched one teacher do this in this little first grade and this boy says, I can just feel my dendrites sprouting, you know. So kids love to learn about the brain. I think they need to know one, how connections are made, and two, neuroplasticity. How, what they do with their brains, especially for adolescents, what they're doing with their brains is literally sculpting. So if they're spending all their time playing video games, they are creating a video game brain, all right? So I'd say how connections are made and neuroplasticity are the two most important things that all kids need to understand about their brains. You mentioned left and right hemispheres. Can uh, you be left dominant or right dominant? 
Okay, so when I said there's no such thing as a left brain person or a right brain person, can you be left dominant or right dominant? A better way to look at that is, is what we call a learning style. For example, genetically, I was born this way. I am a concrete, sequential, organized out the kazoo, probably too much. Um, you would say I was left dominant. That's an incorrect term to describe my personality style. So yes, we're all born with different styles. And in a classroom, you've got all four. So one of the problems I have run up against and about my own teaching is because I am so organized and so uh, concrete and so sequential, that's what I valued. And I get upset if kids didn't, you know, label their paper right. Well, what I learned was that there are kids to whom that is not important and I needed more to look at the content. In other words, we teach the way we learn, but we need to realize that everyone does not learn the same way. You might take a look at Myers-Briggs or Gregoric's learning styles to look at these characteristics that we're born with that are genetic that don't change much through our lifetime and learn to value what we do, but to learn to value other styles as well, especially important for a teacher who has all different kinds of learning styles in the classroom. So Pat, let's wrap up with information on uh, how to uh, learn about your February conference, where they can get information on being trained, or if there's training sessions on your website. There are no training sessions on the website, and this training of trainers in Orlando at the end of February, 1st of March, is the only training of trainers I have scheduled at this point. Um, people who go through the training, and I've been running these for about 20 years, become part of what's called the Brainy Bunch. And every January, I hold a Brainy Bunch renewal here in, in California, in Napa, where I invite two leading neuroscientists to come in and share their research with us so that we continue to update and, and learn so that um, the Brain Event Renewal, for example, we'll have two experts come in, one on um, who's doing research on ADHD, another one who's doing research on autism, and spend a day each with us and explain to us what research they're doing. Another one we recently had was, what's the impact of media? How is media changing the brain? Because it is plastic and you have neuroplasticity. Spending a lot of time on media, does that change the brain? Um, unfortunately, that's the only one I have scheduled is the one in Florida. And again, um, you can email me and uh, I will give you all the information you need to register or to get more information about that's a four day training of trainers. So thank you for listening. Um, I've enjoyed this. Please do email me if you have any questions or with uh, more information. Again, that email is on my website and the website is just patwolf.com. Thanks for being with us today.